what we need tonight's pediatrics again. Okay, it seems like we drill a lot of pediatrics, but if you look on your national registry and your state recertification, it's a heavy weight. And it, and it weighs a lot, about 16 hours in two year period, which is more than any other department, uh, except for medical ties it. Uh, but trauma is only like uh, six, uh, like 11 hours or something. So uh, it's considerably less. But uh, so let's get going. We're gonna start talking about uh, traumatic brain injuries with our kiddos. Guys, you'll have to excuse, I'm a little hoarse <clears throat> today. I've been yapping all day. <clears throat> so uh, we'll see if we can get through this. I hear that giggle. <clears throat> so tonight we want to talk about, we want to uh, examine the most common causes of TBI uh, and the age groups that are affected in the United States because that's where we live, that's where we're going we're gonna to learn from. We want to learn about the differences in the, the body function, the way the brain's designed, uh, the box that we have covering it and everything that we have to deal with with our children. We also want to explore uh, current treatments uh, for pre the pre-hospital setting and how we need to educate ourselves with those treatments and why those treatments are so important. And then we want to understand the post-care of our TBI patient. Guys, I'm going to kind of hit home with a few things tonight on that post-care of uh, that patient that goes home and survives their TBI and things we need to do for the family there. Kim's done an incredible job putting this CE together for us tonight. Um, <clears throat> Donnie and I were just moral support on the whole deal. So all the, uh, the beautiful pictures and all that, so she's full credit for that. Traumatic brain injury in children. Uh, this is the number one cause of preventable death in kids. We know that. Trauma is one of the largest population killers of our pediatric population, and we've got to make sure that some of that is preventable trauma, some of that is unpreventable. Uh, but a preventable death, uh, trauma is the number one leading cause of death in our children. For pediatric patients, a large portion of these trauma-related deaths are directly related to TBI only, to traumatic brain injuries. So the head plays a big portion. We're going to talk a lot about that. The Center for D Disease Control defines this, defines a TBI as a cause by a bump, blow, jolt to the head or penetrating head injury that disrupts the normal brain function of the brain. Not rocket science, okay? We know what that means. So toddlers to adolescents form the highest risk group. That may be important. Toddler to adolescents is the highest risk group. Uh, but yet still, our children in the middle of toddler and adolescents are still affected through different mechanisms. <clears throat> mechanisms are important, uh, just as a TBI is not likely to be uh, present in an infant who's driving the car. But again, our adolescents probably not gonna suffer from shaken baby syndrome. So you can see kind of how we define those mechanisms of injury. So let's talk about our kiddos, what affects them. Our infants first and foremost, below the age of one, child abuse is the number one killer of those children. Guys, there's not, there, there, we've had a rash of those lately of horrible, bad TBIs with kids that we've had to take their airway in the field. Guys, those are hard calls for us. That's just as hard on us as it is on anybody. Toddlers, uh, once again, they start to get into the fall. They're falling from objects. Things are falling on them. They may be climbing up uh, the TV stand, and here comes the TV, and all on them, it squishes their head. Adolescence, this is where we start moving into our motor vehicle accidents. These kids are becoming more active, getting out, and whether they're driving or not, still motor vehicle accidents is the number one cause of the TBI for our adolescents. Sports uh, and recreational uh, is a very high association with our concussed and our TBI. I want you to start thinking that concussed word or concussion is directly related with the TBI. That's what it is. And we're learning a lot of things about uh, uh, concussions as the NFL is going through some changes now. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. So some of the recent statistics from uh, 2009 from the CDC, 240,000 children under the age of 19 were seen for TBI or concussion together. Uh, related uh, seen at the emergency room in one year. It's a lot of kids with some head injuries. So the different types of traumatic brain injury, we start talking about the diffused uh, axle injuries, we start talking about the uh, concussed, then we start talking about the hematomas, the contusions, and the skull fractures, and we're gonna break each one of these down. So let's talk about the diffusion. <clears throat> Guys, this is where we actually have injury to the gray matter. 
Okay, so we've left all of our bleeds area. We're down to the actual brain portion. And this is where we start to get injury to the nerve endings from the gray matter getting shifted around. It's gonna be a dis disruption in the neurons uh, at that point, and we're gonna start uh, to see that these are a lot of times from, um, from a twisting. This is from blunt trauma. This is from uh, rotational forces. And you're gonna see as we get a lot of those uh, deep gray matter areas, we start to diffuse and we start to actually break away at those neurons inside the brain and they're not, letting, they're not able to function anymore uh, on a normal basis. Then we move into our concussions. And guys, like we talked about, <clears throat> the, the NFL has done a big study these days and they've related some, uh, some very uh, famous NFL players' deaths directly related to the number of concussions they've had and for the atrophy that it's caused in the brain and the permanent brain damage that it has for uh, years and years of uh, having those head injuries. Now, back when Allen played ball, okay, <laughs> back when Allen played ball back in the day, when he had his concussions, he threw up and they sent him back in. Most of us kids, or most of us, anybody under the age of about, over the age of about 30 in the room, that's what they did. If you had a concussion on the sideline, you were able to puke, or if you were able to answer a couple of questions, they sent you right back in. This is the where we start talking about our secondary concussions, or so-called our second hip phenomenon, that, that the NFL starts to talk about. So our concussion is considered a mild TBI that may be temporary, it may take a few minutes to heal from it, or it may take several months. And that's why you'll see these nowadays, if your kid, uh, Brian, you got a kid to play football, or a kid that does sports. He did. If he had a concussion, what did they do? They pull him out, and they then they've got to pass a, a a test over the next few weeks to see if they're cognitively ready to come back into playing sports again, and because they're trying to avoid this second hit phenomenon that we're seeing that can be so deadly in some instances. Then we start talking about our hematomas. Let's review our hematomas real quick. So we have our epidural hematomas. Remember, this is the bleed that involves the area between the skull and the dura mater, or our tough mother. And so these are gonna be our very critical, or our emergent bleeds. These are the ones that cause a lot of problems. Typically, they're gonna bleed fairly quickly from a skull fracture, and they're gonna to start to create issues for us very quickly because it puts pressure on that dura mater and starts squeezing things down. Then we move into our subdural. This is our older folks that may have fallen last week or five days ago, three days ago, and now they wake up unconscious that day. You know, they find them uh, unconscious or they're disoriented, they're having decreased LOC. When we start talking about our subdural hematomas, this is where we move from our uh, dura to between our dura and our arachnoid area. And so we start to create those slower bleeds here and this is going to be a slower bleed over time that's going to kind of leak in and start to perform the pressure. Then we have our subarachnoid hemorrhages. This is between the, once again, the arachnoid area right there and uh, moving into the pia mater area. So we're starting to build those uh, bleeds areas. Sometimes these may be, uh, it's very hard to determine what the outcome or what the signs and symptoms of these patients are because it all depends on how big that bleed area is at that time. And then last but not least, our intracranial hemorrhages. Guys, these are the ones where the actual brain itself, the gray matter itself is actually bleeding from injury to vessels that is actually in the gray area. So not only do you have that, but then you may have that diffusion too. So you may have the breaking of those neurons that aren't able to connect. And so now we've, we're, you can see we're starting to build on that. We're starting to have some big problems nowadays. So let's talk about our contusions real quick. So not only do we have our contusions forming from bruising and swelling that's in the brain from where our, our small vessels, and remember this is actually on the brain, on the gray matter area. So this is where we start to worry about our coup and our contracue. This is where we start worrying about the push forward and the push back and what happens with that. Uh, these, sometimes these uh, problems may delay for several hours or several days. So you may have suspected that they have that coup contra cure, they have that concussion, and then you start thinking about that mechanism, and then over a few days they start to have a decrease in level of consciousness, or they may have, because that's the slow bleed in there, 
it's actually kind of an intracranial hemorrhage that's kind of controlled in that one small area. Primary brain injuries, we start talking about uh, understanding the primary and the secondary. We're going to start talking a lot more about the secondary here in just a second. But we have our first impact here. So uh, Brian Payne gets mad at Andrew, and what does he do? He hits him in the head with a, with a bat, <coughs> and then he's winded from swinging the bat, but that's okay. <laughs> so we have our impact area here. This is our first portion. Andrew falls back, hits his head, and then his brain moves back, and that's where we get our coup contra coup. And these are our endocranial hemorrhages once again uh, that are very contained. We have bruising on both sides of the brain and we have impact on both sides. Typically is what we're seeing is the opposite side of the brain that didn't receive the blow, but the, the uh, secondary portion of it sometimes may be even, uh, maybe even damaged even more than the initial impact. So what makes our brain injury so difficult to treat? <clears throat> well, there's a lot of things uh, that add to this but we start talking about at the very beginning is our brain occupies 80% of our box 80% 10% of it is occupied by blood and the other 10% is is cerebral spinal fluid and so I don't have a lot of room and as a grown adult by age not by the way I act but by my age everything's sealed up in there and so my closed box there is keeping everything contained and it doesn't give me any outlet for any movement. And so you can see why these brain injuries become so problematic so quick as our brain swells or I'm bleeding inside of there. <coughs> uh, unlike uh, air and brain tissue, the spinal fluid in the blood does not compress. There's nowhere for it to compress to. There's nowhere to leak to if it's a closed head injury. So the uh, cerebral spinal fluid and the intracranial hemorrhages um, are early in the injury, but then we may have problems as we continue to swell over time, and that box has no room for movement. Uh, venous blood may actually back up into the uh, jugular areas at that time, so you may have this, the uh, swelling there, uh, or you may be displacing the, spree, the, the CSF further down to the spinal canal or what we call where we move into the herniation portion. Uh, once these mechanisms are exhausted, even a small amount of cerebral, uh, cerebral hemorrhage or cerebral edema becomes even more problematic because our ICP goes up because it doesn't have anywhere to go. We start looking at our secondary <coughs> uh, brain injuries. Uh, and these may develop minutes later. They may develop weeks later. You know, people say, well, he was in a car accident and I was sitting there talking to him and like two minutes after the wreck, he falls over. Well, that's one of those that we have a diffuse problem very quickly. And so I've had a lot of swelling or a lot of bleeding and they may be able to have that conversation for the first couple of seconds and then move forward into an unconscious or decreased LOC state. Um, and as you can see here, got a nice big bleed right here. Okay, you're starting to have the secondary problem is this is pushing. <coughs> Now I notice my midline is starting to actually go away up in here. My ventricle is starting to move away and I'm starting to have some shift on my midline right there. <clears throat> the brain itself is not able to do a lot besides just start to squeeze. That gray matter is compressible at that point. The problem is the CSF in the blood is not. It's gotta have somewhere to go so it's gonna push gray matter and then that's where we run into our uh, problems over time. <laughs> And so this is where uh, we would we, we like to talk about how much the secondary brain injury may occur. We're going to talk about things that affect that secondary side. So what's, uh, what worsens the secondary? We talked about this in uh, January of this last year when we did our March, March when we came back from uh, Eagles last year. This is one of the big hot topics is Eagles is talking about what is preventable with your brain injuries. Because guys, whenever a lot of us paramedics in the room hear some of us older guys, as y'all call us, when we were young, we were taught that if they got a brain injury, they got a brain injury. That's it. But as what we're learning with modern medicine, you have the ability to influence what goes on at that secondary injury state. And there's some of those things that are preventable. <clears throat> we start talking about hypo, uh, hypoxemia. So we're talking about decreased oxygen. Well, I can give them oxygen, I can ventilate them, or I can intubate them. 
hypotension. A lot of times we don't have a lot of control over that hypotension, but we can watch those trends that it start going down and start correcting it earlier. We're going to talk a lot more about these here in just a second. Hypercarbia and hypocarbia. The amount of CO2 leaving the body. I can control that if that patient's intubated for sure. And I can at least monitor it to know what my trends are with my conscious patient. Hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. These are the things that are affectable by us right here. Now, hyperglycemia in the field, we're not going to treat it. But you can see these right here, we have a direct impact of how we can take care of that patient. Then you worry about electrolyte imbalances, increased in uh, intracranial hemorrhage, how much bleeding, uh, coagulation, how much blood clotting they're having or not having, whether what their INR is, if they're on platelet deaggregators or uh, blood thinners at home. We do have a little bit of effect over the seizure because we can stop that seizure activity with some of our drugs. Now, Dr. Troutman, what would you say a head injury that seizes, the chances of you get it stopped pretty quick? Probably pretty low because I mean it's a mechanical reason we're compressing on the brain. It's not really, I mean it's electrical activity but it's because of a traumatic insult. So the benzos don't necessarily go in and break it all the way. So you may not have a lot of control over this portion, but at the same time we've got to treat it like we do okay and then last but not least hypothermia uh, i'm sorry hyperthermia we do have the ability to take care of some of the uh thermia <clears throat> some of the heating or some of the cooling measures at that point uh, so you can see a lot of these things in the pre-hospital world we are able to control because it has a direct impact of how much swelling they're going to have that swelling that if we can take care of it early on you're gonna see it's gonna be able to benefit that patient of getting them out of that coma later if they progress to that point, or possibly how much brain injury is done long-term. <clears throat> so we talk, continue as we talk about the uh, secondary brain injury, even hospital interventions can't always prevent these things. Because then we talk and start talking about glutamate. We've talked a lot about glutamate during our seizure time. We talked about seizures at case review this year. Remember, that is the uh, excitability of the neurotransmitters in the brain. As that glutamate starts to dump in, those neurotransmitters get fired up. Okay, this is one thing we don't have control over. This is one thing, unfortunately, they don't have control over it in the hospital either. We also talk about inflammation. Uh, children um, under the age of four may suffer more inflammation in the brain than older children do. One study suggests higher levels of interlu interlutin interleukins interleukins uh one six and ten guys and so what is an interleukin it's a protein that's released by the immune system that causes inflammation it's just it's like a, it's a messenger it's a me yeah, yeah. messenger that sends it up and so you've got a combination of this is dumping these are dumping you're swelling the neurotransmitters are excited and that's where those tbis start to cease the unfortunate thing is we can treat some of that but we can't control these per se especially in the field sometimes on the hospital side sometimes with us not being able to control these this is where we get the swelling of the brain it's not controllable that they can't get stopped this is where they, when they start to herniate uh, and, and there's nothing you can do at that point because you're so far behind the eight ball uh, because the injury is so deep we start talking about cerebral edema uh, both the preventable and unpreventable uh, mediators that cause the secondary um, along with damage to the blood to the brain and the blood barriers there um, this is going to cause the, once again the swelling this is where we start to get our disabilities and our death uh, sometimes we can control some of these things but then you've got the glutamate you got the lactates the uh, electrolyte imbalances um, you got the oxygen free radicals the histamines you got everything that's dumping in the body and even by modern times even by the modern medicine that we have now, we're still very limited with what we can do to stop this side of medicine. We can correct the hypercarbia or the hypocarbia. We can correct the thermic, the, uh, the temperature control. We can, uh, we can fix the sugars, but at the end of the day, there's still a lot of uh, uh, sides or these are kind of like what I like to call the comorbidities, things that I have no control over with the cerebral demon. of unconsciousness. The main culprit, what physicians call deceleration injury. 
at a speed of just 35 miles per hour, a head can decelerate to zero in a split second. The results can be catastrophic. On impact, the brain ricochets within the skull, damaging the part of the brain closest to the point of impact and the part farthest away. Like all injured tissue, it begins to swell, a disastrous response for an organ confined by bone. Within the brain, billions of tiny calamities play out in that instant. Brain cells, or neurons, have thin tentacles that reach out toward each other. In a violent impact, these tentacles stretch and sometimes snap, spewing chemicals that they normally emit in small regulated bursts. This chemical brainstorm only adds to the swelling. Pressure mounts within the skull, squeezing off the blood supply to the outermost layers of the brain, the thinking, feeling part of us, called the cerebral cortex. If the pressure rises enough, it will also begin to squeeze off the blood supply to the brain stem, the primitive core that controls our most basic life impulses, breathing, heart rate, temperature, and wherever swelling squeezes off blood supply, the brain begins to die, starved of fuel and oxygen. How much of the brain dies will dictate the coma's outcome. Unchecked swelling will kill both cortex and brainstem, resulting in brain death. Lesser swelling may destroy only the cortex and spare the brainstem, and the coma may evolve into indefinite unconsciousness. Swelling that subsides quickly enough will spare both parts of the brain, and the patient may regain consciousness. Okay, so I know that was kind of an older film. See, I but think it, that same editor did like my sex ed video in sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Some of y'all, yeah. But I remember that, you're probably right. Yeah, it sounded pretty much the same. But guys, it just kind of gives you that show of that box and what those neurotransmitters and what that cause is. So, why are kids so different with this? Let's get to the pediatric portion of this. From newborn till about age two, our brain, or excuse me, our skull is broken up into basically eight different sectors. All of those being on suture lines that are not sealed yet. So, being saying that, those suture lines still have the ability to somewhat move, to somewhat be able to expand. So our kiddos at young ages, typically below the age of two, uh, and some, some literature even suggests one and a half to two, somewhere in that neighborhood, can accommodate the swelling of the cranial sector. So as I have that brain swelling, I've got those suture lines that are still loose and can still move. So about the age of two, these suture lines actually start to close, and so now the advantage is lost by our kids. So some of the disadvantages to, to our infants and our children once again, is their body to head ratio. You've all seen those kids, you know, that's why you put your little infant in the little donut <clears throat> because their, their head is this big and their little flimsy neck, their pencil necks can't hold that up yet. And so you, you just don't have the support. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't, you know, a kid's got a, my little three-year-old nephew's running around and his head is this stinking big on his little bitty body. And what's the first thing that goes down and hits is his head. So that's probably one of the biggest disadvantages for the kiddos. At the same time, the infant and the child's neck is a lot more flexible. So as you saw in the video with their head going way back like that, that's where we get a lot of coup, contra coup movement is because their neck just isn't strong enough to support at that point. Uh, there's more subarachnoid space in our kids. So the brain is actually smaller. You have a lot more room in the subarachnoid area that gives it more room to move in there. So I have an increased injury uh, pattern of seeing the vessels injured uh, in that area so that as with our coup contra coup forces. So you have a larger space that can be damaged because you have a lot more movement of the brain. So some of the signs and symptoms, very similar to our adult populations. You may see the headache. Okay, well first of all, how is that three month old gonna tell me that was shaking baby that they have a headache? It may be that irritable cry. It may be the uncomfortableness, the, uh, you know, the unsteadiness. You know, they're, they're just constantly moving around. They're agitated. Vomiting, uh, that should be pretty much all. Ultra level of consciousness, decreased uh, GCS. Cushing's triad, remember how we have irregular respirations. 
bradycardia with hot, some hyper, hypertension. And you're gonna see a case like that here in just a little bit. <clears throat> and then last but not least, as we progress, we move into the seizure and the posturing portion of that. So overall timeline of a TBI, the kid suffers a blow to the head, uh, the brain undergoes uh, an accelerated and then a deceleration movement. It stretches those neuron fibers. They exchange uh, the, uh, the glutamate. And so you're gonna see that that's gonna start to really, you know, can increase that potential of seizure at that point. Uh, alterations of blood flow around the brain, brain, which is gonna then turn around into how much oxygen is getting to the brain. If my blood flow is not flowing, then I'm not having the oxygen there that I need. Then the inflammation kicks in, and so now I have start to have the swelling effect, uh, which is going to even cut down more, make more anoxia because I'm losing that blood flow. So the pre-hospital care, uh, it needs to start as soon as we can, as soon as we get on scene. <clears throat> hypotension, this is something that we may get there, they may already be hypotensive. This is something we may get there, they may have a respiratory rate of three, and so they're already anoxic. These are the two most common contributors, and some of the literature suggests up to 30% increase in mortality with one hypotensive or one hypoxia episode, one. And now if you have a combination of two of them, that can cause a whole other set of issues. Also, you've got to think about our TBIs. Typically, what does our blood pressure do with the TBI? It goes up, why? Why does it go up? It's squeezing, but what's my body trying to do? Perfuse. So it's going to increase pressure trying to perfuse. You may see the mean arterial pressure sometimes of between 90 and 110 to try to perfuse a, a sick brain. So if our TBI is hypotensive, you need to have a very high suspicion of bleeding somewhere else. Or I've got another problem. Interabdominal trauma, uh, pericardial tamponade, you may have a hemo uh, or a pneumothorax, hemothorax, or you may be in spinal shock at that point. So you've got to really weigh in, think about, well, my TBIs usually aren't hypotensive, so if they are, I need to have an underlying cause. But the bad thing is that hypotension is going to be one of those big contributing factors to uh, the total death of, or a serious brain injury, TBI, and a poor outcome for the kid. <clears throat> so recommended care for uh, suspicion of TBI, go to the basics first. That IV is not going to help that kid unless they're hypotensive. I'll give you that, but that's rare. But what's the number one thing is we've got to take care of that airway. Okay, we've got to make sure they, they can protect their airway. They're not going to aspirate. And we want to make sure that we can uh, provide good pulses and we can uh, provide good oxygenation to them. Avoid hypercarbia or hypocarbia. Guys, if they're intubated, we have direct control over this. I can either speed up my respirations to blow more off I can slow my respirations down to in order for me to help hold on to some of that CO2. Our goal, 35 to 45. Raise the head of bed, especially with us not using backboards anymore. This is the best thing for the patient. Maybe set them up, get them to a 30 degree angle, allow the blood flow to go to the right direction. And then last but not least, analgesia and sedation. Guys, uh, if they are hurting or they are seizing, that increases ICP immediately. Take care of their pain. Be aggressive with your pain management. When they're hurting, it's going to drive more pressure. If they're going to sit there and they're going to try to guard, they're going to try to flex, you know, they may be stressing, that is going to increase ICP, which is going to increase the problems in the long-term uh, probability of permanent damage or death. Uh, at the hospital, you may see them uh, a lot of different. Uh, they need to get a CT scan quickly. We know that. That's why we want to give early notification to the emergency room uh, with the signs and symptoms that we're seeing so we start making decisions to get that CT scan as soon as possible. If we have an intubatum, that's something they want to do fairly quickly for oxygenation, ventilation, and protection from aspiration. Uh, IV fluids. Now, guys, you may see them. We're going to start just a standard crystalloid in the field, but if we have large swelling, you're going to them, see them switch over to a hypertonic 3% solution uh, in order to help saline to help uh, with that ICP out. At the same time, we need to take care of pain, sedation, and then we want to help decrease uh, ICP, and that's where we start talking about our mannitols. Stuff that's going to pull that fluid off of the brain, put it back in the uh, interstitial space where we can actually void it off uh, of the body. And then last but not least, a surgical procedure uh, or putting a bolt or a craniotomy in uh, if required. 
So real quick, you may see them do this in the emergency room pretty quick when you get there, especially right out of CT scan. Uh, real quick, they just do a quick incision, they bore a hole, they run a catheter in there, and this is gonna give my ICP pressures. Normal ICP bolt pressure should be between about five and 15. Uh, with sometimes with TBI, I've seen 50, 52, I think is the highest I've ever seen. Have you seen, I'm sure you've probably seen very high Troutman before. Well, I can yeah, get very high. Get, get, get yeah, up to the 60s the and 70s. Yeah. But, uh, so this is a picture of the craniotomy. This is also something that we may be taking out of an ICU, maybe moving somewhere else. Uh, and so maybe some of you may be responsible for at some point. Uh, but at this point, uh, they, they've done the craniotomy. You can see, I wanted to really point out how thick the skull is. And you, we, we talk about the skull to be in a closed box, but how thick that skull is. It's very, very thick, very fibrous, uh, very sturdy. Uh, it takes a lot to break it, to fracture it, to crack it. Um, <clears throat> but you can see they've actually got the subdural hematoma right here and uh, they've got the section and they're actually evacuating and trying to clip what needs to be clipped uh, and get it all cleaned up and then a lot of times they'll leave that portion of the skull out for a time period uh, and until the brain has time to uh, unswell and then they'll be able to put the uh, portion of the brain or excuse me portion of the skull uh, back in place and close everything up. So as we, uh, we, something we want to talk about is the post care of our traumatic brain injuries. So um, we've had a horrible bad accident, uh, somebody has been uh, injured and now they've gone home. Uh, when you start talking about children that this happens to, it takes a large toll on the family. And this is something that we want to discuss with you guys uh, as being that post care of TBI. This is one of those things that <clears throat> um, this is a, a lot of times with a, a horror, with a bad brain injury, a bad TBI, uh, a lot of these families are dealing with lifetime long injuries. Uh, a lot of these are permanent injuries. Some of them may be temporary. Some of them may be improvement over time. You know, the child may become more alert over time as the brain repairs itself. Remember, our children are resilient. But this is something that we want to discuss with you guys. And they did a study uh, of the moderate effects to severe TBIs uh, over a five-year period. They had 42 parents participate in this study in 13 different states. And here's some of the things that the parents said. First of all, they were great that they, they were grateful that they still had their child there. <coughs> uh, soon after the injury uh, <coughs> has occurred, and the parents start to reflect back on the positive that at least I still have my child present. But then they move into the grieving of the child that they knew, and they remember the times, you know, when they were able to go out to the games, or they were able to, um, you know, they were able to go and do things. The child was riding the bike and would come and go out of the house, and that's not a possibility anymore. And a lot of times, healthcare providers, uh, as they get ready to discharge from the hospital, are starting to talk to them about this long-term effect. Uh, that they may have and some parents just have a hard time accepting that and taking that as their own uh, <clears throat> but you can see uh, that, that it needs to be explained in layman's terms of, of kind of what the projections are now once again just short of a miracle or, or children you know once again are resilient they can their brains can retrain themselves uh, these these effects come into place and so you may see an improvement over time as you're running on these children over the next several years Next, and this was the most, uh, the strongest thing that came out of that is they, the parents feel like they run on nerves all the time. Uh, stress to both the internal family and the external. So we talk about the employer, the social aspect, you know, their friends that you, they used to hang out with and do things with. And then healthcare encounters. Uh, parents would uh, sacrifice just about anything for the needs of their kids. And a lot of times this takes a huge toll on the family. Uh, this takes a, a large toll on the entire family, whether it be extended or the local family, uh, the other children in the residence. And so that is a definite big factor over us caring for them because we need to meet the needs of those family members just as much as we need to meet the needs of the family. Uh, and then grappling with what the child, uh, the child and the family's needs are. Um, this can be a lot of, uh, a lot of times uh, very hard as they uh, we're trying to identify all the needs. And this is where social workers come into a big place uh, or home health uh, plays a huge role in this. And it may be that home health nurse or that uh, nurse, uh, the mom that, that's there caring for that child all the time and uh, meeting their needs as well. And maybe they just need that ride to the hospital uh, in order to allow somebody else to care for that child for a short period of time to where they can have a little bit of period uh, 
just to kind of relax just a little bit because now they're not about they have to be that person 24 7. that's just the big thing is we need to make sure we're meeting there's those needs <clears throat> As we talk about uh, some things, we want to uh, have some aspects to consider with the family. First of all, respect. Uh, and and I, I think we do a great job respecting our bedside manners very good, and that's to our patient, but at the same time, we've got to apply that to our family. Uh, these families are under a, a lot of stress, whether it be, once again, you know, uh, just the day-to-day -day care of the child, going to work, and caring for the child, and meeting all the needs of the, fam the rest of the family. Uh, don't disregard their observations. That's a huge big thing. Uh, you've got a parent that's with that child 24-7 and they say all of a sudden I notice that there's a small twitch in the in the corner of the eye or maybe in the corner of the mouth and they say that's not normal. It's what that tells me is okay they that this child could be seizing and that's their focal seizure. They know their children um, because they're with them all the time. It's hard as a provider to come in and say, I need to take your child to the hospital, but what's going on? And you see the small twitch and go, you know, that, that may not be a seizure, but that mom knows or that father or that caregiver knows that patient uh, intimately. They, they're with them all the time. And, and so th we've got to trust what they say and use that, just like we do with our other children that we've taught for years. Patience. This is a very big thing for us. A lot of times, especially at EMS, uh, our job is to get in and get out, get them to the hospital. We want to try to do that uh, as, as safe and as po fast as possible. As we may have a large call volume, we may have things that are going on, we need to get back, it may be at the end of shift change. But this is one of these things that they, the patient may have had, they've, they've been in the hospital a long period of time. They've uh, They've had a lot of experiences with healthcare workers and you as a paramedic coming in and providing that care, they may have had a bad experience at some point with that. It may be that child is just can't do it. And so that's when you're gonna to have to really lean on the mom, be patient, allow that caregiver, whether it be the mom, the dad, or the, the nurse, the social worker, to give some time to help comfort that child. That's gonna make your job a lot easier at the end of the day. And it may be I have to have mom in the back of the ambulance with that comfort at all times. Last but not least, compassion. Guys, you can't imagine the amount of tragedy, hopelessness, and the financial strain that these families have. You know, they sometimes they may snap at you. That's it's not meant towards you. It's just meant toward, you know, they're so stressed at that point. It may be how are we gonna pay for all of this stuff? You know, the medical bills add up very quickly, even with insurance, even with great insurance, the medical bills add up quickly. And that, that plays a huge toll, so we need to be very compassionate toward that. So Dr. Troutman, some of his take home points is <clears throat> we want to really emphasize that, that uh, specialty care of that patient once they get home from a TBI. You know, he, Dr. Troutman had stated uh, that, that it was very important that, that we pay attention to the, the family's needs as a whole, uh, that patient's needs, uh, that we're able to meet them where they are. You know, it may be that the child needs those two parents in the back of the ambulance because that's the only thing that's going to keep that child um, that keeps the child calm, keep them comfortable, to reduce their ICP, to, to make them comfortable. And so that's what we, we may have to do is just meet them where we are. So we want to talk about the case, <clears throat> uh, first of all. So this is the report of the month. Uh, and very uh, congratulations to Kaylin Davis. She did a very good job documenting this report. Uh, unfortunately, it was a child abuse case, and so that adds to uh, a lot of this uh, the stress level of EMS at that time because you have a high suspicion of what's going on. This was an eight-month-old uh, infant who was brought out uh, to EMS uh, on arrival. EMS uh, told the parents and stated that the child uh, woke up very agitated and suddenly became unresponsive. Okay, so we know as healthcare providers that that right there, uh, kind of, you know, something's not totally right here. Uh, so it was stated that the parents told them that the patient felt, they felt like they had a bump on the right side of the back of the head. Uh, EMS palpated the head and felt a bump, but it felt somewhat symmetrical to that other side. Uh, there was no bruising or redness noted at this time, but you've got an unresponsive child. The child did have a history of a little heart murmur, but no, nothing else uh, significant at that point. So the patient was brought out to the ambulance. Uh, the patient was agonal on arrival, uh, appeared to have decorticate style posturing, and was stiff and not moving on the left side. So that tells me, you know, have I had a, uh, you know, do I have a bleed? Do I have a stroke? Uh, what what has transpired here? As you can see, the vital signs: 116 over 56. 
Uh, a little hypertensive in my opinion for a child, an eight month old child, I'd be a little concerned. Big red flag right there, okay, I've got something that's taking that to perfuse that baby at this point, to perfuse the brain so the body's trying to really kick in. Uh, the heart rate was 69, okay, so we're in a bradycardic rhythm with, with minimal to no respirations and saturations are 65%. So the child was brought out to the ambulance agonal at that time, oxygen is being applied um, and assessments being done. So the child is definitely right now uh, getting into Cushing's triad. You've got a lot of, you've got the hypertension, you've got the bradycardia, and you've got the low respirations or no respirations at that point. So very high indicator, uh, very quickly got a heart monitor on, started ventilating them. Uh, they got an IV very quickly, did a great job. Then they tried Narcan. And so everybody's going, hmm, well, you've got an unresponsive respiratory uh, that's not breathing very well or hardly at all. Great indication of using Narcan right here to make sure. There was also a report, and Kaylin does a very nice job documenting, that Narcan was given due to pupils being pinpoint, and there was a mention of possible narcotics being in the residence. So that's a, that's a very good thing. At that time, they went ahead and elected to use the atropine uh, to go ahead and protect against the succinylcholine. We already had a bradycardic rhythm. That was a very good choice right there. Once again, they moved into the lidocaine uh, for the possible uh, uh, protection of the ICP uh, with it binding to the CO and pulling it off, the CO2. Uh, then they moved to the succinylcholine and the atomidae. They got the patient intubated. And they got the patient intubated with a 3.02, which is a little small for that patient, but they caught that very quick. They had a big leak. They weren't able to get their stats up, so they elected to go ahead and do a tube change right there, and they just reintubated the patient with a 4, had no further problems, and then moved to fentanyl for sedation. At that time, they noticed a little crackling and wheezing, so they went ahead with a dual nab, good choice. Uh, but as you can see, they had to resedate the patient again. So now our blood pressure's come down 82 over 54. That tells me that you know that baby was stressing really bad. Of course, our our, uh, our heart rate was very low at that time. Now heart rate's nice and strong at 155, which is probably still a little high for this child. The child needs to be sedated, uh, but you can see that, that at least they fixed it and then they're not bradycardic at this point. I'd rather take the tachycardia over the bradycardia. They're assisting the ventilation, saturations are up, and big point right here is end titles. We've, we've talked today about end titles uh, being a big part. We do not want to allow them to have any hypocarbia or hypercarbia. This is something I can fix, especially with intubation. Now, as we talk about that, we talked about the, the uh, hypotension the hypothermia, the bradycardia, the low oxygen saturations, and the hypercarbia and hypocarbia. So we've talked about those things increasing the chances of the TBI being detrimental or being uh, fatal at that point. It directly affects morbidity and mor mortality. Uh, as you can see, we've already had a hypertensive state, which it, that's what it's taken to perfuse. But we had a, a major bradycardic state and low saturations from the apnea. So we were at 65. So we've already got two of those battles. I would venture to say that initial end titles were probably very hypercarbic because that child wasn't breathing. And so this child has a lot of morbidity and mortality starting to add up very quickly because of those things that we discussed earlier that were already comorbidities to the uh, TBI. Once again, uh, she just continues on with uh, her um, assessments, once again using the fentanyl, uh, another dose of fentanyl for sedation. You can see that the heart rate uh, does come down some, uh, actually uh, kind of holds steady, but there, our blood pressure is good. And our blood pressure is climbing just a little bit, and that's that body's natural response of saying, but they're holding their end titles very well, they're holding their pulse oximetry very well. And so that's one of those things that decreases that comorbidity to the TBI is keeping those things in, uh, in good shape. Once again, uh, she does her scores, uses the pediatric GCS scale. A lot of times, guys, and, and it happens to all of us, but we get so used to using that adult scale, but she actually selected the PD section, which is very crucial at this point. So let's look at the CT scan. This is the CT scan of the baby once we get to the hospital. As you can see, uh, you do have a large bleed. Bleeding on CT scan is going to be bright white, but as you can see, this is bright, but it's also got a large dark center, which may be an indication of an old bleed or an old injury or possibly an old tumor. Uh, Dr. Troutman just wanted to point that out, that, that 
that is a, a fresh bleed, but it does look a little funny with having a dark center. You have also lost the ventricle right here on this side. You do have an open ventricle, and you can see the uh, midline shift right here. It's a little difficult to see. Uh, this actually may be the ventricle over here squeezed. It's really hard to tell at this point, but you do have a full displacement uh, of the gray matter and then you have the soft tissue swelling on the outside. I really don't see uh, at this view, I really don't see the, the skull fracture at that point. But then, uh, so this is the actual radiology report and it just it confirms that there is a uh, hemispheric bleed uh, here uh, on the left side. But then we use the 3D imaging. And this is, now we've talked about the suture line, so this is sector one, two, three, four, and then same on the other side, we, we have eight, uh, eight small suture lines that are good up to about H2 before they totally close. But as you can see right here, this is a large fracture, and it's a large fracture actually with some separation in there. So this was a, a very large uh, portion of the posterior aspect of the head, uh, moving around to the posterior aspect of the head from the occipitals, uh, a large fracture there. So that's why uh, the 3D imaging is there. So let's talk about the long-term effects. Well, the first day the kid underwent an emergency decompression craniotomy, uh, ICP uh, drain was put in. Uh, they had to fight ICP pressures and then they had to start finally on hypertonic 3% uh, solution. Uh, eventually they added some phenobarbital to it to help protect those uh, excited neurotransmitters, the glutamate, uh, from firing off and causing seizure activity. They're trying to soothe that out before that happens. Uh, also, we talked about you know the seizure was one of those comorbidities to trauma or to the TBI that can affect the uh, mor morbidity and mortality at the end of the day. The first step was discontinued. Um, at that time, uh, the drain was uh, showing that ICP was increasing. They went ahead and moved over to uh, some uh, mannitol in order to start pulling that uh, pulling that off uh, the fluid off, and uh, they also continued with the. Uh, uh, the pentobarbital or the uh, long term just to prevent that seizing. Uh, they also started with a little hyperventilation. Remember, we're going to talk about that carbia uh, situation. They're going to help try to pull that CO2 off to help uh, decrease that ICP, and that'll help lower that at the end of the day. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact uh, any of the training staff, the FTO, the senior FTO, myself, uh, and we'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Have a good day.